but I was saturated with uh, forgiveness and love and compassion. It just saturated my entire being. From from that moment on, it it wasn't just coming into me, but it was going out for me. And I became aware that there is a presence, and you know the best way I could describe it, there's a divine presence. Always was there, always is there. Always, you know, we can't escape it. It is the, our background consciousness. And that never left me. That that propelled me forward. Hi, my name is Marty Wetke, and this is your superior self. Marty, thank you so much for taking the time. How are you this evening? I'm great. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Man, I was looking at your website, and you guys have a lot of science supporting some of that meditation you're doing over there. Yeah, yeah. How did you get into this work? Um, well, it was a, a, a journey that started in my adolescence. I um, got, I was uh, raised in New York. And during my teenage years, I got into a mess of drugs and uh, sort of ran with the wrong crowd and ended up getting heavily addicted by the time I was seven, 17 years old. Um, I went through, you know, all the all the things that were available back then. And this is in the 70s, uh, different drug treatment programs. Uh, I think there was a total of seven programs uh, over the course of four or five years, many overdoses from uh, heroin. And um, uh, my father died in the middle of all this, so I was kind of uh, uh, left out in the woods, so to speak. And uh, <clears throat> I had pretty much resigned myself to uh, dying young. I knew the course that I was on it was headed in a bad direction. But... Uh, Around um, uh, the time I was 21 years old, and the exact date was October 28th, 1978, I was at a, a probably the worst point of the entire process, and I, um, I had a spiritual experience, and that didn't last long, and like many other people, uh, in uh, you know battling addictions, this wasn't anything unique. It happens quite often uh, when I talk about it. Uh, many people come up and say, "Oh yes, I had that too," but it turned my life around. And uh, what came out of that experience was a realization that I that I had a, a mission. I was um, you know I needed to do something. I uh, made it out of a, a, a horror, and um, I needed to devote my life uh, to trying to help other people so i um i originally was uh going pre-med i thought that medicine was uh going to be my ministry but i i switched up after a couple of years and ended up moving to georgia to attend chiropractic university so i went there for a couple of years but after about two years i i became obsessed with what happened to me? You know, I wanted to understand from a physiologic perspective and particularly a neurological perspective, what happened in those seconds where I had this spiritual experience and this new spiritual awareness that transformed me so dramatically. So I ended up moving uh, from uh, Atlanta up to the mountains of North Georgia to live at a yoga retreat center. You know, there was a, a, a spiritual teacher there who had been, um, he was the last living disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda, the author of Autobiography of a Yogi. It was a beautiful place. It was sort of a semi-monastic environment when I lived there. So I lived there uh, and spent two years uh, studying, working there as well, but uh, meditating several hours a day under the direction of my spiritual teacher. And one day I found out that there was a, a treatment center there in the local town, just seven miles away from the center. And I went there to go for a tour and I met the uh, medical director and the psychiatrist. 
And they asked me who I was, what I was doing there, and said, would you like to do something for us, maybe teach some meditation? I said, sure. So I started to teach meditation to a select group of the patients there. It was a small hospital, but it was beautiful. It was like a resort up in the mountains. And um, what happened was uh, during the medical director's rounds at night, the people who were attending the meditation started to say, this is profound stuff. You know, my pain's gone. My cravings are gone. So he approached me and said, um, you know, would you like to design a program that would run alongside our program? And I, I said, sure. So I realized early on, though, and this this is uh, the early 80s, and this is in very rural Georgia. Uh, meditation was barely known um, and certainly not being used in inpatient psychiatric hospitals yet. I mean, it came later on. So I realized that I needed to give scientific credibility and validity to the meditation process that I was teaching. So I went and studied. I went uh, I went to the Himalayan Institute in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, studied with Swami Rama. He was, I figured I'd go to the leading experts. Swami Rama was the fellow, the yogi, who um, they uh, did research on at the Menninger Institute. He could stop his heartbeat, could change his brain waves at will. He could, uh, he could alter the temperature on the palm of his hand by 17 degrees from the, from the left side to the right and just make it go back and forth. He, he, wow. he had mastered complete physiologic control. He stayed in a cave in the Himalayas for a year where he learned how to do all that. So I studied with him and uh, he even, he had, he had a very large Institute in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. And um, I learned a lot. He had a biofeedback lab. So I came back to the hospital uh, after I, I finished my studies, armed with a lot of knowledge and particularly what meditation does to the brain. And again, my my reasoning was, well, spiritual waking is not some far out mystical thing that happens in the ether somewhere. It happens <laughs> it happens in our nervous system. That's where it happens. It's not it's not a I mean, yes, it's mystical, but the transformation happens physio physiologically, and you can measure it. So I, I I decided, well, if we if 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 this is what happens to the meditator's brain, and particularly to the brain waves, that's the key. And then I said, well, there's this thing, this new science called brainwave biofeedback, and can we accelerate the meditation process by using this tool, this you know high tech. And sure enough, what, what happened was, though, we only had people for 30 days in the hospital. It was a 30, 30. It's all the insurance companies would pay for, for people's treatment. And immediately what happened was, um, you know, although my goal was to, you know, get people to quiet their minds and learn how to meditate and hopefully have a spiritual experience, what, what started to happen was similar to the meditation. People started reporting that their pain was going away, their anxiety, their depression, treated a lot of eating disorders, they were getting great results with them. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder were, were responding. And uh, and that that became you know the path for neurofeedback. Um, and then I got published in a biofeedback journal and it kind of went exponential from there, it went worldwide. That was in the, the early 90s. Um, so I just I just kept pursuing and doing what I do. I I went to Europe and uh, opened offices in Netherlands. Um, but my my primary focus has always been on um, you know how can we facilitate the uh, this awakening process with people because it's I think you, you would you would uh, you would um, go along with this. That seems to be the key um, to transformation. Uh, so, you know, I've been doing it for almost 40 years now, since since 1983, and, um, and uh, it, it continues to evolve. The technology has dramatically changed the past few years, and also a lot of research has come out that really shows what happens in the brain when we 
hit higher states of consciousness and so on. Mm. So that that's what got me here. I'm in uh, Santa Barbara, California now, working on lots of projects. Um, the it, the field uh, has come a long way. You know, if you Google neurofeedback provider near me now, you're going to find one. They're everywhere. When I started doing this 40 years ago, there was literally me and maybe this many other people around the world doing it. Hmm. So it's it's a it's it's come a long way, and I think it's going to go a long way. Sure. Uh, military military is using it now. Special ops forces military is using it for brain injury and post traumatic stress disorder. So hmm. it's it's picking up, and athletes athletes have gripped it too. Sure, I'm interested in the experience, right? Can you describe that, like that spiritual experience that you had that started all of this? What I had. Mm -hmm. um, so as, uh, as, as most addicts, I was full of shame and guilt and, uh, and remorse and self-loathing. And what happened was I was homeless at this point <clears throat> and I was staying in my sister's house uh, and, and really in, in rough physical shape. I weigh about 210 now i think i was about 165 now and you know living on heroin and iced tea and it was just terrible uh so i it, it was a, it was a profound moment of surrender you know it was kind of like okay if there's anything really going on here whatever this thing is we call reality i give up and uh that did it surrender you know is always a, a good thing to do um and i i was Best way I can describe it, there it involved a vision, but I was saturated with uh, forgiveness and love and compassion. It just saturated my entire being, and um, from from that moment on, it it wasn't just coming into me, but it was going out for me, and I became aware that there is a presence, and you know the best way I could describe it, there's a divine presence always was there always is there always you know we can't escape it it is the, our background consciousness and that never left me that that propelled me forward and um and i i, I really wanted to know how you know how, how that happened what what really happened in my brain to produce that sure can i ask you a tough question right um being that you were an addict at that point have, has anyone ever asked you if that experience was in, was induced because of the, the heroin or anything? Well, like that's that? what I thought. I was like, <laughs> oh my God, all these drugs caught up with me. I've gone crazy. And I really, I doubted it for days, but I, I could not um, argue with the profound sense, you know, this, this overwhelming sense of, of, of love, of um, compassion, of forgiveness, uh, it was just it was just too strong, and within three or four days, I you know I kind of accepted it, and um, and physically my whole body changed too. So it was it was good. But I yeah I it's not a tough question. Believe me, I, I thought that for days. I was like shit, shit I've lost it now. Oh, no. <laughs> Did you automatically get clean after that? No, I still I you know I still had cravings for a while. Um, you know, when you, when I, was, uh, I had a pretty big habit, uh, but, uh, it, it, it wasn't long before that was it. It was just in my past and, um, cravings finally went away after a period of time. I think most people who, you know, go through addiction or, you know, your body is gonna, gonna want that substance, whatever it was, but it, 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 it went away. Mm. Do you still have cravings at all? Right. Do you uh, feel your body? No? no, no, that's awesome, man. Maybe uh, a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, man. Sugar is mine, right? Like getting off of that was the toughest thing. Well, I that's ever had hard. To that's hard. That's a tough one. I still, you know, I still sneak some Jolly Ranchers every now and then, and uh, <laughs> you know what I mean. So yeah. it's, uh, it's tough. I, you know, I, I, I quit drinking, which was a tough thing for me. It's not like I, I, you know, I, I totally like stopped right like it was gradual over time but it was like all the sugar that was in like a beer or something like that yeah. like that it was so tough right like i and i immediately started losing the weight and um started running more and um, i was able to focus more and it just feels so great right like i mean i'll you know if, if i'm out somewhere and it's like 
uh, it has to be like um, a special occasion for me to have like a a, a beer, right? But mm-hmm. even after that, I, I just feel like totally just like like shit, and um, it messes with my consciousness, and it's like it's just not even worth it. Like it just screws up everything the next day, and my meditations are are, are pretty, um, I don't know, not as deep and as meaningful. Like when I when I when I have those substances substances in my in my body, so. Mm-hmm. Uh, I try to stay away from that stuff, especially um, sugar. But it's tough, man. I'm telling you, dude. Um, have you have you been able to have like a, a repeat experience since then, yeah. like yeah. spiritually? Yeah. yeah, yeah. When I went to uh, live at the retreat center, I had many experiences and and some more profound than that uh, initial one. And um, you know, I was. You know, I was around uh, uh, this meditation guru who had been um, with his guru for 60 years. So he and he, since my father died, he was not just my spiritual mentor, but he sort of took over the father role. And he guided me along uh, initially with meditation and so on and that, I, which I needed. Um, so, that, so I had many, many profound experiences those first two years and continue to now we we have a big office here 3,000 square feet and 1,000 square feet is a meditation hall that we have meditations and teach meditation so and that's still you know that's still my my go-to mm. so yeah. You know. What are some of the, like, like, it's so interesting, right? Like it, the, the experiences, the spirituality aspect of that, like, what have you been able to do? I'm so interested in that um, because I've been meditating like every morning, right. And experiencing the void, right. But what else have people been able to experience? Well, there's a huge variety, you know, of meditation experiences that you can have and you can go through um, void, uh, light, sound, um just awareness of of presence but most you know uh authentic meditation teachers will say keep keep going past whatever you experience because when you when you hit that point of uh not void but even beyond the void there's a, a point of uh uh profound silence and quiet and it, you know, it kind of envelops the mind and body and, and the whole spirit. So, um, but, you know, people have, I've, uh, as many people as I've taught and as long as I've been doing it, I've seen everything uh, or heard everything from different people. Mm-hmm. And a lot depends on the meditation style that you use, uh, you know, whether you're doing mantra or breath work or chanting. Different meditation techniques are going to produce different changes in the physiology is there like a technique that you prefer right like yeah. some, like focusing on the breath yeah breath and um the the tradition that i uh, am in is called kriya yoga kriya just means action but kriya yoga uses uh, uh pranayama some specific breathing techniques that are described in yogananda's book order autobiography of a yogi it doesn't tell you how to do them but they're described and that is uh, that has been a key for me. The um, general idea around the Kriya Yoga Pranayama is um, redirecting the life force uh, in the spine and up into the brain and the higher brain centers, because um, normally this 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 life force that we are is flowing out to the world. Well, uh, the yogi said you have to turn that around if you want to wake up and bring it back to its source. That's a very powerful technique. Then there's mantra meditation, which I'll occasionally do breath. But, um, you know, it, it, it's to the point now, I, and I not every meditation is perfect and blissful, you know, sitting there thinking about how many patients I have today and all that. But uh, the majority of the time, if I can sit long enough, um, that peace and calm will come over me and, and um, sort of wipe all that stuff out, so. Yogananda's book, I read that. It is from a Western mindset, it is crazy, right? Like just thinking <laughs> about some of the stories that are in that. Like, have you ever experienced like some of the your your uh teachers like you know being in two places at once? No, no. That I was like some of these stories on this bi location. No, I know. I mean, it's like 
Okay, I want to go to that village. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. I have not witnessed any miracles. Uh, it was a miracle I'm alive, but um, I ha I haven't. You know, he talks about some really far out stuff in there, but I, I have not. Um, you know, I've, I've not witnessed any of that myself. Sure, but I mean, being being able to make your heart stop like that's pretty intense, right? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. That took a lot of practice for Swami Rama to do that. Like I said, it took him a year, but he he could do uh, remarkable things. I wouldn't even talk about um, because that's really far out. He wrote. If you really want to read some far out stuff, he wrote a book called Living with the Himalayan Masters. Mm -hmm. That'll really <laughs> make you a jaw drop when you read read some of those stories. Which, so as he, far as he, I know, it. Huh? He moves from the Himalayas and he moves to Pennsylvania. <laughs> well, his, his his teacher said that you got to go there, just like uh -huh. Yogananda's teacher did. Said, "Do you go to the West? Bring yoga to the West." So, wow, I, I guess maybe Pennsylvania is pretty similar, right? It's pretty mountainous, right? That part in Homesdale is beautiful. It's really a old. Um, the the rock formations are millions and millions of years old, um, and he. Um, it was a, uh, an old monastery was donated to him. Beautiful place. It was like 800 acres. Very, very nice. Wow. And what was the book that he wrote? Uh, Living with the Himalayan Masters. That's quite a, a, a mind blower. <laughs> I have to get that now. Not you got to get now. that. It'll make Yogananda seem tame. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are your thoughts on some of those stories, right? Like the people that can do these, these well, epic things. Um, you know, my my guru knew Sai Baba, I used to visit him a lot. You know who, who Sai Baba was? He passed away a few years ago. You know, Sai Baba had uh, the cities, developed all of his cities, and he could wave his hand around and manifest things. He did it constantly, and they filmed him doing it. And um, I asked my guru, Roy, about it once. He said, oh, yeah, I was sitting there watching him. There was a bunch of kids around. I was watching his hand, and all of a sudden, it went brum, 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 and chocolate oozed out, <laughs> and he started giving all the kids chocolate. So I, I think that, um, you know, cities, which is is translated as soul abilities, we all potential, we all have them, uh, and but you know, not developed. I, I think they're real. Uh, the, but the point is, uh don't get trapped in trying to develop psychic abilities and clairvoyance in cities and uh, by location. If that stuff comes, great, but it's not the goal. It's not the purpose of a spiritual path. So, um, so, you know, I, I, I think, I think a lot of that stuff is true. I think a lot of it is exaggerated as well, but you know, I, I don't know. And I know, uh, I, I don't know. Again, some of the stories in living with the Himalayan masters, I guess so. I don't, I don't know. Sure. Um, well, what is the goal, right? Like, is it to achieve like a certain state of awakeness? Like, what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it, the, it, it's pretty simple just to, to, uh, to be awake and it's not really achieving it. It's to realize you already are, which is an annoying thing to say to somebody. But um, it, it's it's to unveil the reality of our own being. Mm -hmm. um, well, I hear you say that, right? And I'm just mm -hmm. being um, just very curious, right? Like to awaken to our own being, to be awake. That is the goal. Awake to what? Like our true nature, like who we yeah. really are. Our, 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 what is our identity, I guess? Yeah, what we really are. It's not a who. We're not a who, we're a what. And we're the universal self individualized in these bodies um and all of us have varying degrees of identification with the body with the name with uh, our memories i mean we if you really start examining uh who we are what we think we are we're, we're just a bundle of memory so when we wake up when we get past that we realize that we are the awareness that is behind all that. We're just the pure awareness. And if we are having memories or if we're having anger, if we're having a happiness, we're just moving through those parts of the mind. The awareness is identifying with anger. 
awareness is identifying with happiness awareness is identifying with the thoughts it's like you know so we're not we're none of those things we're just the awareness that we've always been um and we can't identify with those things that's like visiting san francisco and saying i am san francisco no your awareness moving through san francisco so we're just this pure awareness and you know that it's it's a it's a you know and you hear different teachers talk about this we just realize what we already are and always have been and always will be uh is it a big deal well when it happens it's like duh you know why didn't i see this before <laughs> it's more of a shift of perspective mm -hmm. sort of recognizing what's already there it's not becoming this eyes rolling up in the head and levitating you know if if if, if a teacher tries to pull that one on you run the other way <laughs> It's just not how it is. Well, is the state of bliss like ultimate realization of that state, right? Like, is yeah, that a well, side effect of that? It's, you know, it's called sat chit ananda. So, sat is existence, pure existence. Whoa, here I am. We all have flesh. I exist. Uh, chit, consciousness. You're conscious of that. And then ananda is bliss. And it's not, you know, bliss that comes from the outside anywhere. It's, it's the bliss. Of, of knowing, you know, just the bliss of just that. Again, you know, the best the best way I explain this to a lot of people, is, you know, when you have a, a moment in nature and, and you know all is well and everything is right, you're experiencing a, de a degree of that. I mean, we all go into samadhi every night in the first three hours of sleep. That's what happens. That's why we're alive. That's why you can destroy your body and your mind with a, uh, interrupting and messing up the sleep cycle but we we merge with the universal source of energy in that uh, deepest stage of sleep in the first three hours and that's where the body and mind get rejuvenated and regenerated but we lose our identity there we don't you get woke up you don't know where you are who you are and that's because you're you're actually experiencing the truth of your of your identity then well, what did your teacher say about that, right? Like when we when we leave this plane of resistance, like do we keep that identity of of who we are here? You know what I mean? We remember it. But we know that that, you know, we know that that is not our identity, just like our car is not our identity. Um, you know, we may have the memory of, of this was the uh, body and the karma I was born into, but that's not what I am. So hmm. that's really, that was sort of his message. Hmm. Have you ever had like out of body experiences? Yeah. Yeah. And But it was, you know, this is, is another uh, funny point because it's really, you know, if, if, if you understand that consciousness, especially when you start reading uh, string theory and quantum physics, it's everywhere. So, you know, the experience is more that my body is in my mind, not that my mind is in my body. Hmm. So I've had these expansive experiences, which you can measure in, in the brain, uh, where, you know, I felt what omnipresence was. What does that really mean? Well, we're everywhere anyway. So, um, you know, there's, I, I did have uh, experiences of drug overdoses and such where I'm floating around on the ceiling looking at, at my dying body. And then fortunately fell back in, but um, you know, I'm, it's never been anything I've consciously sat around and said, "Okay, let me astrally project." You know, that's that's just silly stuff and a waste of time, man. It really, really is. Really? Oh gosh, wow. yeah. Um, so what you were experiencing with the overdoses is is what could be like um, uh, someone could classify as like a possible near death experience, almost. Yeah, for sure. Did you experience yeah. like any other like um like like guides or anything near you at that time no 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 no, no apparitions just um the message was clear this is not your time mm. and, and did that come to you through like a thought form like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i tell you what it was terrible i was in a horrible uh you know what we called the shooting gallery in new york and um and uh the drug dealers there gave me what's called a hot shot which was meant to overdose me and, uh, you know, kill me and get my money. So when I got it and next thing I knew I was floating up in the air, I thought, 
I thought, not here, not now, you know, because they just would have took my body. And, and uh and that that was then I then I got this notion, thought form, uh, it's not your time. And the next thing I knew I was uh jumping up off of the floor. So Wow. That's that's so powerful. Uh, because I've heard so many different near death near death experiences. I think a lot of it has to do with belief systems too, right? Like absolutely depending, depending upon what your belief system is, like you'll meet yes. that whatever that belief system no, is. No, no doubt about that. I, I fully, fully believe in that. Because I'm I'm I've worked with hospice and I know a lot of people who, you know, have had these experiences. So when you're working with hospice, have you been at the, the moment of death with some? Yeah. Yeah, it's a profound experience. Um, you know, if you learn, you know, there's there's a whole um, movement called shared death experience uh, that, uh, you know, you're actually trained to, you know, kind of just be with that person as they transition out of the body. And um, that's profound when you learn how to do it. It's like a, a portal opens and you can feel this you know, change in the space, change in the energy. It's quite lovely, quite, quite wonderful. And um, I've, I've, I've uh, witnessed it several times, but it came shared experience came from the reports from uh, doctors and nurses in emergency rooms. You know, they person dies on the table and they have all kinds of interesting experiences occur. Sure. Dr. Raymond Moody, he came on and he talked about the shared experience where yeah, I think he was, he was here a few years ago. I met with him and we talked a lot about that. Sure. I'm sure people who have done work in hospice care can attest to that. Right. Like I, oh, it's, gosh, yeah. it's probably like this. I don't know. I, I couldn't even imagine it. Like, I mean, you've, you felt it right. Um, where you have this, I don't know. I don't even, I mean, can you, can you remember it? Can you remember details of that shared experience? Yeah, I mean, you feel, you f you know, uh, when you go into a sacred place, a place where people have worshipped or meditated or, or whatever, um, you, you feel this this energy. I used to do tours of the cathedrals in Europe and uh, went to uh, various cave monasteries in China, visited Taoist caves, and there's this energy. Well, it's the same. It's the same thing. There's this. You know, you can feel it. It's it's palpable. This energy shift that occurs in the room, and like I said, it's like a it's like this this door opens, and there's there's a flood of, uh, um, you know, I, I guess the best best words I could put on it: blissful energy, and peaceful. Mm -hmm. um, and I had one experience. Uh, you know, the many teachers uh, in meditation will will instruct the student to learn to hear the ohm sound and it's not that you hear ohm 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 you hear the steady hum sound and that's what the ohm is and one friend of mine who passed i came to the room about a half an hour after he passed and it was thunderous it was almost deafening the, the sound of ohm and he had been a long time meditator and devotee and uh that was remarkable that was the last uh experience i had shared death it was two or three years ago wow through meditation have you been able to connect with with his consciousness at all no no, no. and i don't try to i let him go let him whatever his uh you know whatever his path is uh move on and um you know and that that was always discouraged uh by my teacher and his teacher you know don't don't try to channel into somebody let you know they're they're doing their thing moving on wherever they need to go and just just don't mess around with them take care of yourself take care of yourself for sure i think that's it right like that just having this experience and um being in it right instead of like becoming aware of what we truly are like to your point about us being that universal awareness like the pure awareness state right like people mm -hmm. I feel like, and I fell into this category as well, where there's some, um, there's some issues with spiritual bypassing, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, can you speak to that? Like, what is that and how do people fall into that trap? Well, we get impatient. I mean, you know, we're in a technology age where, you know, we can get anything we want, uh, pick up our phone, a few clicks. Uh, and you know, the, the um, shortcuts are quite popular now, various 
psychedelics. Um, and I've, you know, I've witnessed a lot of that. And I've seen some people have true experiences and real changes occur from various psychedelics, plant medicines, and so on. But honestly, I haven't seen a lot lasting. And and because, just like, I don't think we can bypass, for instance, uh, the Dalai Lama was um, asked about that once years ago. And he said, well, what about the 30 or 40 years, you know, my students spend meditating and disciplining their minds and their emotions? He said, you can't bypass all that stuff. You've you you you've got to work through those levels to reach these higher levels and be functional. In those. And I think that's part of the problem that when people do bypass, they haven't completed some work that needs to be completed. If you look at the structure of the brain, we have these primitive areas of the brain, the limbic system, and then higher and higher centers. Well, it, you can bypass that limbic system, but it's going to mess with you. It's like you know, you hit higher states of consciousness, it's like sunlight. It's going to shine equally on the flowers and the weeds. And if you got weeds in there, they're going to get exposed. That's why you see so many scandals with spiritual teachers. You know, this, they're messing around with their students or they're taking money. Well, they haven't dealt with some of the basic human stuff that uh, is in their brain. Mm -hmm. So um, so I think that's another danger of trying to do spiritual bypass you know, let me take the shortcut. Let me take the quick route. Sure. Yeah. No, we all fall into that, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's 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 seductive. It's like, oh, really? I can yeah. I can take a hit and see God. Yeah. yeah okay. Then what? <laughs> <laughs> well, how, yeah. Exactly. Where Where are you at in your journey? Where if you do see God, like, what? How do you come back from that? Right. Like, yeah, how do and, you change? Yeah, and is your limbic system can it handle that? You know, it literally is like uh you know running a, a thousand watts through a 40 watt light bulb our nervous systems can't handle some of this oh that's why i wanted to ask you right like as you reach higher levels of consciousness how does your body change uh, it transforms um it's it's a refinement process so you you know reaction patterns um that come from lower parts of the brain limbic system they all begin to quiet as you as you practice meditation. So, I mean, if you look at, you know, certain uh, teachings of meditation, you see that they're really encouraging a whole neurological process uh, from calming the body, calming the breath, calming the mind, calming the emotions. Even, you know, in, in yoga, there's the yamas and niyamas, kind of like the Ten Commandments. You know, those are really important because those help quiet down the weeds. But all that is necessary to get the nervous system uh, prepared. So what is the end result of that? You know, we can only speculate. Uh, uh, Yogananda's body, after he passed, they were keeping it. They were in, uh, interring it because they were waiting for his family and students from India to come over. So after three weeks, the Los Angeles uh, Times wrote an article, there's no, there's no corruption in this body. It is not decaying. And that, you know, is considered the the ultimate of what uh, what of the body transformation that have not that we're trying to make the physical body immortal, but there's a profound transformation that occurs in the cells. Mm. So, mm. yeah, I mean, I guess you always hear that, right? Like as a spiritual seeker, or if you're just turning on to this work, you always hear that raising your vibration, raising your consciousness. Like, what does that really mean, right? Like. I've always was confused by that when I first started. Um, I don't. Our our vibration is already up there. We don't need to raise it. We we if anything, we have to quiet down the parts of us that are resistant to it, or that keep this sort of veil in our faces. But I mean, we're we are the divine consciousness, whether we like it or not, or know it or not. We have a lot of homeless people around here in Santa Barbara because the climate's so incredible. And, um, you know, every day I get to look at 10 or 15 of them. That's this divine consciousness laying there on the ground. Uh, it's a good practice. Uh, um, but th that's, that's the truth about it. We raising it is, is, you know, that, yeah, there's a transformation process 
and that um, enables us to handle more energy. But we're we already we're all divine. There's nobody's higher or lower. Everybody is the same consciousness manifesting. Mm -hmm. Well, do you find yourself like falling back down right from that and seeing like a you know uh, a person who may be irritating you and like driving you crazy and do you fall into old patterns where you kind of yeah 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 of course I, I pull myself out pretty quickly not as bad as i used to be but uh no absolutely i i get i still get pissed off um anger uh but you know that's what my meditations are for to sort of integrate all this human stuff that i you know, human karma that i still have going on in me you know i'm not a saint and uh i haven't met many saints and usually if, if if you do they'll tell you dirty jokes just so that you don't get too enamored with them <laughs> that's so, what i always say right like I, I like to think that like my jesus right like the guy that that i like would like to think that as jesus like would you know bust some balls here now and then absolutely. you know what i mean listen you and you know it's that's the truth and it really bothers me when um you know, when I meet a teacher or see a teacher who who puts on that, you know, holier than thou, I'm so spiritual, which is, excuse me, just bull crap. Um, and and sort of evidence that they're either playing a game on purpose or delusional. I, I, don't, I don't know. But I, I don't buy into any of that. It's it's we're sure. all we're all the same. Well, like the Dalai Lama, like I've never met him, but I read a couple of his books, and he seems very ch childlike, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm sure he's playing some games on people, dude. You know what I mean? Like it seems like he's you know he's having fun while being the Dalai Lama. Yes, definitely. I think it was we need to re, you know be reminded of that, right? Like, um to not take this life too seriously and when we feel anger it's because of the human experience right it yeah. is it's to honor that too it's just an, it's just like happiness or joy it's an emotion that we're here to experience and like yeah. instead of like pushing it down and you know creating more trauma in the body right like to to honor it and integrate it into our enti entire being absolutely and and always or try to remind ourselves that we are the awareness watching it we're not the anger. We're the awareness that happens to be watching the anger right now. That's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that helps a lot. Sure. Yeah. It's, um, you have any kids? Yeah. Cause Two I have kids. three and I have, it's a daily reminder, my friend. <laughs> it's a daily sure is. reminder. <laughs> Well, well, remember what Ram Das said? He said, if you think you're so enlightened, go visit your family for a week. <laughs> That's funny because like Ram Das was like, you know, talking to your point about psychedelics and LSD and, and like spiritual bypassing. Like he was all in that in that whole movement. Right. Yeah. When he was at Harvard and then he goes and he meets his guru and he swallows like four pills and he's just sitting there hanging out like you don't need this stuff. Right. Like, you know, yeah, he's like, <laughs> give me more. I don't feel anything. <laughs> And Ram Dass is like, I think I just killed this guy, right? Like, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, he's like watching him all day, like trying to take in data and experiment, like with this guy taking this like high dose of LSD and he he does nothing happens to him. He's just kind of like in his usual state. And he's like, man, yeah. he's like, you don't need that, right? Like, and to your point, it's not lasting, right? Like you have this crazy right. experience, experiencing universe firsthand and then you come back down, but you're the same person, right? And where all these, these gurus and mystical um teachers are in this state it seems like for longer periods of time yeah yeah for sure are you in those states like can you get to those states like throughout the day like a regular day more often than not they happen spontaneously you know when i i'm not trying i think that's one of the keys quit um you know quit pushing quit trying but yeah i mean i'll i'll have moments of um you know, just connecting with reality. Sure. I had that today, driving to work, just kind of like looking at, um, just like the, the trees, man, you mm -hmm. know, like just looking at them and like, it wasn't that, that long ago when they were just bare and then they, now they have leaves, you know, yeah. like in there, and greens everywhere and thinking to myself, man, isn't this like the best visual of life? like death then rebirth and death and rebirth and yeah. you know i just was in this state of like 
oh, I'm just driving my car, man, and I'm experiencing this. There you go. You yeah. And then to tomorrow, I'll, yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't have to take a pill, but tomorrow, you know, it could be totally different. I could, I could hit traffic and be cussing out the guy in front of me, but you know, it yeah. is a, it is a practice. Yeah. Um, what's the brain, right? Like, what's the brain neurofeedback? What's the data show as far as states? Like, what state, brain state, are people experiencing when they're having these moments of bliss? Like, what is that? Well, there, there, there's different ones and there's different combinations. You've got, uh, you know, thousands and trillions of, of brain cells and then different networks. So there will be specific areas of the brain that light up when you have uh, parts of the brain, oddly enough, that um, uh, create your boundaries, like the boundary of your skin, the boundary of your body and so on. And so those parts light up when you experience this boundlessness. Um, bliss and compassion uh, are different roots in the brain. Um, but the most interesting thing, which surprised researchers, was that the cortex, the, the higher brain, the newest part of the brain, uh, goes into a state of extreme excitability when you're experiencing higher states of consciousness. They first found it, excuse me, in the 1950s with some Kriya Yoga meditators, and they found it more, more recently with the Dalai Lama's advanced Tibetan meditators. But when that part of the brain lights up, that goes back to the analogy I use with the sunshine. It's, this, it's like this magnification of consciousness. And if the lower parts of the brain get in the way it can it can freak you out pretty badly in fact i think that's what a lot of bad trips are so so really when we when we measure brainwave frequency called gamma gamma is 40 hertz high frequency but at the same time the limbic system has to be quiet so that it's kind of a paradoxical state there's extreme uh quiescence parasympathetic relaxation and then sympathetic arousal so you have these two components put together that seem paradoxical but in reality that's what we see in higher states mm. so interesting what about um thoughts right like you talk about the limbic system and our thoughts what does our brain look like when we can quiet those down quiet our thoughts down yeah yeah uh well you see a reduction in activity you know you'll see you'll see uh uh, brain waves that that indicate too much act, too much thinking, like beta waves, will quiet, and then uh, slower brain waves like theta and alpha will become more dominant. It's just a, it's a shift of power, mm. and it goes along with brain quieting. Mm. And if you go too far, you'll go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what about? channelers right like have you ever like done neurofeedback on a channeler's brain um I, not while they were channeling mm -hmm. uh and i'll tell you i worked with an entire group of uh alleged psychics in atlanta and what i found was um you know whether their channeling was authentic or not every one of them was a survivor of trauma quite often sexual trauma and if you've been traumatized as a child you learn to read everything that's going on around you just to make just to be safe and um you know i i, I always wanted to do a study to measure well is that what people are calling channeling just this their own you know internal hallucination or, or are they really working with disembodied beings um, it's nothing that I really am interested in or mess around with, frankly. Um, but I would imagine, you know, I could make this up channeling. Uh, if you see something, it's probably, they're probably in theta or even a slower brainwave. Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah. What is the, what's the, like, if I am in a meditation and I want to receive guidance, like what's the best method, right? Like what is, you, you talk about Korea. However, I feel like that's like a tradition you have to be accepted in and then they give you uh, or like, no, not, like a, no. 
No, you just, uh, I mean, you have to find somebody to, to teach you and initiate you, but the techniques are, you know, on YouTube now. You can Google them. And I always question them, though, right? Like, are there actual Korea techniques, right? Like, or just somebody just making up? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, this... most of the time they're the real deal, but yeah. there's something to being initiated into it. You know, there's some. Makes it more special. Energetic, yeah. Yeah. Hold you more accountable for it, I guess. Carry, well, it carries a certain energy. Mm, really? And, and most traditions do. Mm -hmm. so. Um. So when you get into these, uh, especially early morning, is there a certain time that's best for meditation? Is it early morning? Yeah, whenever? Yeah, between three and four. You know, that's called the hour of Brahma, uh, when all of the <clears throat> electrical energies in nature are, are quiet and, you know, there's less stirring of uh, humanity. That's considered a, to be a great time. That's why you see many yogis using that time for meditation. So after three before sunrise you know any time in there is good mm -hmm. have you ever experienced uh you um have worked with so many clients like um why am i having a brain fart right now like when the energy moves up your spinal column and uh what is that called when they have that kundalini. experience kundalini yes kundalini have you ever experienced that or had clients oh, yeah. experience that yeah 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 what does that feel like I like an electric current. Usually it's warm and you, you know, the spine sort of straightens out and you feel this energy rising. Um, you know, depending on, uh, on how relaxed you are, it's not an unpleasant experience for sure. I had it a lot in the beginning, uh, not much anymore. And the, the Kriya Yoga technique is actually designed to work with that. Hmm. That's so fascinating. Drawing and it's a current, you know. It's a, you know, we, when you see the visuals of it, there's a, a serpent at the base of the spine that's considered the Kundalini energy. And when that wakes up, it starts to rise up the spine, moving through the different chakras. Mm. Well, after forty years of doing all the all of this work, like what are you what are you experiencing now in your meditation and in your work personally? Um, you know, I'm I'm so service oriented, mission oriented. That in my meditations, I'm constantly, well, you, I mean, this, this start out with a question, you know, how do you get guidance? Um, you get guidance the more you quiet your mind. And the guidance may not come in the moment while you're meditating, but it usually comes. It, it, it's clear, you know, what am I supposed to do now? Where am I supposed to go? Who am I supposed to meet? And at a certain point, life uh, just becomes this spontaneous thing that you really don't have to drive this way or that way. Just be open and and have the intention of serving and really, tr you know, trying to, uh, you know, the, the, there was a, a teacher who was asked, you know, I've got all this terrible karma from drug and alcohol use and all this other terrible stuff. How do I, how do I get rid of service? <laughs> he said, serve, learn how to serve, selfless service. And that that appears to be the the key, and the key for me. That's really what my meditations are devoted to now. How can I serve? How can I help my clients? You know, what's the best thing for them? And it, and it usually comes to me. I'd say it's partially why I'm so successful because I'm open to that. Cool, Marty, man, this has been awesome, dude. How can people connect with you? Uh, well, they can uh, go to our website through our website. Uh, there's tons of information on there. There's many podcasts, TV interviews, and so on. Uh, the website is is my last name, Wutke, W-U-T-T-K-E, and then IPI. IPI stands for Infinite Potential Institute dot com. Or uh, our phone number is area code 805-568-4192, 805-568-4192. Mm, there you have it. Reach out, hit them up. Marty, man, this has been awesome, dude. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, Trey, thank you. I appreciate the chat. Hey.